I am seeing some people's class consciousness start to shift to say that, you know, if you work at McDonald's, you should still be able to afford an apartment in the city that you live in. If those people and the person who's making sure that your grandmammy is, you know, comfortable in the hospital because she had open heart surgery, if all of us aren't making money, who, who is making money? Because the bills are getting higher. Hello. I'm trying to be somebody. So make a way, make a way, make a way. I'm trying to be somebody. Hello, everyone. I'm Halise, and welcome to the Trying to Be Somebody video podcast, where I interview mostly creatives of color with the goal of helping you. Today, we have an amazing bonus episode for season two, which, as y'all know, is the Know Your Worth season. And this episode is like so serendipitous because I was just creating content talking about everything she's been doing to enlighten us about what's happening with the writer's strike and the actor's strike. And then the opportunity came to actually get to interview her. And if you haven't already figured out who I'm talking about, I'm talking about Francesca Ramsey. Full disclosure, I am an OG Francesca Ramsey fan back when she was on YouTube creating hair content about her locks. She was one of the first people I discovered on the platform of YouTube and ultimately started a channel. And so it's been really cool to see her professional career unfold on the internet. And that's kind of what we're gonna talk about in the first half of the podcast. We're gonna get into her relationship with the internet, how she manages that, and then also, talk about the writer's strike and the actor strike that's currently going on right now. You literally have creatives right now trying to do what? Quantify their worth, define their worth, know their worth in the industry and advocate for that. So Francesca is a member of the Writers Guild and the Actors Guild and she has been very vocal across her social media around everything that's been going on with the strike. So yeah, this episode just feels so serendipitous. I'm just so excited that this happened and it's just an amazing bonus episode for what ended up being a delightful season two of the Trying to Be Somebody podcast. So without further ado, let's get into this. Let's talk to Francesca. My name is Francesca Ramsey. I'm a TV writer, actress, producer, author, online personality, uh, and the online personality part, to your point, is kind of in flux. I, I I have a tumultuous relationship with the internet, but for better or for worse, I'm still here. Well, that's actually interesting. Hold on. Let's like zoom and enhance on that for a second. Sure. Because, okay. <laughs> yeah, as someone who is also very much on the internet, um, yeah. tell me about this in flux. Like, what do, you, what do you mean when you say in flux? Tumultuous. Well, the internet is, so I heard someone use the analogy of like, you know, if you're, if you brought to a dance, you dance with the person that brought you. And that's how I feel about the internet. Like the internet has opened some amazing doors for me. And so I'm, I'm still here dancing. Like, I don't want to be super negative, but there's just a lot that I dislike about the internet. And I think because, because I've been so accessible for a long time, it's been a blessing and a curse. It's opened doors for me, but it has given people the feeling that they are entitled to aspects of my life. And I will be honest, I'm, you know, like Miss Badu said, I'm an artist. I'm sensitive of my shit. It's always difficult when people have critical or unkind things to say, but because the internet gives people the opportunity to talk to you directly, like that can just really chip away at you. I don't care how self-confident you are or how quote unquote successful you are. Just seeing negative messages can be really hard. And so I'm constantly um, battling between like, how accessible am I? And I've had some friends who have really taken a step back from the internet. And every time I see them, they're like, you can do, you don't need it. You can just quit. And I'm like, can I? I don't know. <laughs> like, well, I'll miss the memes and the jokes. Like, I won't know what the hell's going on. But at the same time, I'm like, will I be happier? Yeah. I know something for me I started doing last year, which I think I need to like, maybe get in another season of doing again is I I download the app to post what I need to post 
And then Mm -hmm. I take the app right back off again. I have an app on my desktop called Self Control where you can block a number of sites for time periods. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'll do that. I'll be like, I'm blocking Twitter for 24 hours, you know? And so I just, even if you restart your computer, it won't let you go on. Um, So things like that have been really helpful. Yeah. But at the same time, like it's that fear of missing out that's hard for me. Um, Cause I like it when my friends who aren't super internet-y are like, Hey, have you heard about that thing that happened in Alabama? I'm like, mama, you are late. Like, <laughs> so late. Been? It's been two weeks. <laughs> right? You know what I mean? Like, and it's also like, it's all fodder for like the creative process as well. Yeah. Like so oh. much of it. Yeah. And I think, you know, amidst the strike, especially I, leading up to the strike, I was having a lot of, um, restlessness about my career and like, what am I doing? And like, oh, um, is like, was this going to happen? Whatever. And now that we're in the midst of the strike, I guess we're at like 118 days or plus or something like that. It has been kind of a weight off of my shoulders in terms of creativity to just like make stuff for the internet and remember what I loved about the creative process. It wasn't that I was like, I got to make this video because I have to pay my bills. It was like, I have something funny to say and I just want to make it. And then I get to see people be like, this was hilarious. Or I was thinking of this, or I sent this to my mom. And you see people in the comments being like, hey girl, did you see this? And I'm like, oh, I miss this part of making things, not the like, let's get on a Zoom and do (laughs) notes. Like, you know, (laughs) that doesn't happen online. And I So I'm trying to hopefully take that with me when the strike ends and like infuse that back into my creative process, just making stuff that is sparking joy for me and I'm excited about. I know that I think the thing that draws people in, especially to YouTube, is like the community aspect. To to your point, that sort of like immediate validation, camaraderie, like togetherness. And then, like you're one of you're one of a few people now that have transitioned. I don't want to say off of YouTube necessarily. Well, I guess yeah, technically off of YouTube. Yeah. Because <laughs> um, you've been on it in like other platforms and other capacities. So I'm like, are you yeah. off? Eh. But like, I'm still dancing with the one that yeah. brought me. I'm not. I'm not on YouTube, but I'm on Instagram, and I begrudgingly joined TikTok, and now I love it. Um, <laughs> A very I, 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 all I, I too was, common story. <laughs> oh my God. That's how like truly it is. It's a gateway drug. You're, you're like, I'm not going to do it. I'm never going to get on TikTok. And then every day I'm like, this is a TikTok. Like, <laughs> and so has it been like going from being an online personality and creative transitioning into the film and TV space in a more traditional capacity? Cause you were writing for some really interesting shows and things like that. Like, did you miss that immediate feedback that you get from the internet. Yeah. I mean, people really don't understand or realize how long the development process is in TV and film especially. Um, So it is really weird to work on something for months and sometimes years before anybody gets to see it. Or in my case, I've been, I've been like in the development grind for six years now on a number of different shows that are in various stages of either, you know, with the strike, I don't know what's happening because I can't talk to the networks, but I, you know, I've had projects that I worked on for years and then they die and then it's just over, you know? And my parents were like, what did you do? Like, (laughs) I didn't do anything. It just didn't like, but where do we see it? And you don't, it's not, it doesn't exist anymore. It's done. Yeah. Um, So yeah, the feeling of immediacy of having an idea and just banging it out and putting it out into the world is something that I really took for granted. And I, when I especially was on YouTube, I used to labor over my video. I would spend hours editing and now on the phone, you could just click a button and you're like green screen done. I used to hang a physical green screen in my living room and have to light it and make sure that it's lit properly. Cause if there's a shadow, part of the green screen's not going to work, you know, yeah. and I'm like, back in my day. <laughs> right now you just, I know like I have, I have become the boomer, but like <laughs> it is so easy now. I'm like, this is nuts. You just push a button and everything is done. It's wild. Um, so again, I'm trying to like recapture that feeling of like, this isn't life or death. It's not rocket science. I'm just going to make it move on. 
versus when you're in the writer's room, you know, you're making, you're working on stuff, you're pitching ideas, there's an approval process. Yeah. You have to write a, a first, you have to write an outline and a first draft and a second draft and then the studio draft and then there's studio notes and then there's a table draft <laughs> and there's a shooting draft. Like you're just like, this is not the thing that I thought I was going to be making however many weeks or months ago, which is a mind fuck, but is something that I've, I've gotten better at navigating. <laughs> Leaning, going into like the strike in general, what is something that has been, I'm sure there are many aspects of the strike that have probably been incredibly frustrating. As someone like on the semi outside creator, content creator yeah. side of things, like, and also having had to, or having had projects be on hold now because of the strike myself. And it's like, yeah. I'm not even in this, ah, you know, but <laughs> solidarity though, y'all figure it out. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Um, but like, what is something that's been just like super frustrating for you about the strike so far? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's so many things, but I think one of the most frustrating has been people outside of the industry who have like a crabs in a barrel mentality about sure. our fight for fair pay. I get messages from people across my content that are like, yeah, well, nurses don't make enough money, yes, I so I don't care about you. Mm-hmm. And to that, I just say, yeah, nurses should be paid more. I am not responsible for nurses not being paid well. Like I am fighting for fair wages from the studios and the studios, when we win, because I believe we will win, this will not last forever, the money that we are rightfully entitled to will not be coming out of the pockets of nurses and teachers and whoever else. And so it's very frustrating that people have been tricked into believing that it's an us versus them situation, that if I'm treated fairly, that they're not being treated fairly. I just remember when I worked in corporate America, this would happen a lot of times. Like you would complain that something, well, this isn't right. And then your boss would be like, well, that's what it was like when I was working here. Okay. That like, we could change it just because it was bad for you. doesn't mean it has to be bad for all of us. Like this is not a sorority. We're not being hazed, you know, like we can make things better. UPS was potentially going to go on strike Mm -hmm. for increased hourly wages. And there were tons of people that were like, well, they just deliver packages. Why should they be making? I don't make. Yes. You should make more money too. (laughs) Like, like you let, let's think about this. (laughs) Who's making, if, if everybody, if the actors on your TV are going, I can't pay my bills, right. and the person who's making sure that you get your package in 24 hours, because you just, you know, you need that Blu-ray tomorrow, if those people and the person who's making sure that your grandmammy is, you know, comfortable in the hospital because she had open heart surgery, if all of us aren't making money, who... Who is making money? Because the bills are getting higher. Like, ask your, hello. Hello. <laughs> and so it's like, I get so, like, do you see me getting worked? Like, no, my I heart is I'm like, get it. Preach. I, I'm like, who, who? I didn't do it. I didn't do it to you. I did not do it to you. And so, like, I am seeing some people's class consciousness start to shift to say that, you know, if you work at McDonald's, you should still be able to afford an apartment in the city that you live in. I know I do very well for myself. I work very hard, but I've always juggled like five jobs, always, because I never made enough money doing one job. It's been really eye-opening how many people were just like assuming I was wealthy. They were like, but you, I see you and your cute little apartment. I'm like, yes, I'm a great designer. Every month I'm like, oh, like, you know, I'm that gif with like the numbers like floating <laughs> around me trying to figure out like how am I paying my bills this month? Um, but that is the, um, the prevailing attitude about people in our business. A lot of people just assume I see this person on TV all the time. They must be making tons of money. Yeah. And the reality is a lot of people are just scraping by and the progress you don't just add like can I have can I please like no you have to be like listen we shouldn't we shouldn't shit down let's go um and so that's why we're doing it yeah it's crazy I remember for me it was like seeing I think (laughs) Evelyn started sending me some of the actors as well who were showing their residual checks and I was like bro 
Not yeah. the residual check being let my look. My AdSense is already trash, first of all. But not the residual <laughs> check being less than my AdSense for a hit show on a major yeah. network. That was a oh, groundbreaking yeah. show for that network. That one, em- that, that one Emmys and lots of awards and. You know, I think the other part of it too on the acting side, and I don't act as much as I would like to, and and that's really why I got into writing, Mm. is the amount of money that is necessary to like be quote unquote famous is wild. Like when I got into the industry, I realized like no wonder so many Nepo babies thrive. Right. You need a publicist and you need a a stylist and you need a makeup artist and you need to have like new, you can't be photographed in the same clothes, right. yeah. <laughs> you know, on top of paying commissions to your manager, your agent, your business manager, your lawyer. And then, you know, you book a guest starring role and it's five grand, which is, you know, oh my God, five grand. But like, that's not a lot of money if you had to audition and if you had to pay for your self tape auditions. So you get the audition and you spend 30 bucks to go tape it at a self tape studio. Oh. You spend hours to learn the material um, and turn it around, edit it together, get your lighting set up and all that stuff. You do 40 of those. If you're lucky, you get an audition every week. Okay. So let's say you get an audition every single week. And then you book one a year. That's that's no money. That's no money. And then say you're on a hit TV show or you book a job. This is one of the core issues of the strike is you have to film in Canada. They often don't pay you for that. You got to get yourself to Canada. You have to find an apartment. Bro. You have to rent a car. Oh, yeah. That's something that they're asking for. Relocation fees. The studio says, well, you know, now that you're here in Canada where we're shooting, you are a resident now. So we don't have to pay you um, a a per diem while you're here. So some people are actually spending their own money to be on a television show. Oh. And then everybody is going to clown you if you show up to the red carpet. Look at Ashy. (laughs) Well, I I gotta get a stylist now. Uh, who, who pays for this? You, you pay. Well, now you understand why somebody whose mommy and daddy are already famous right. is going to glide into the industry. Yeah. They don't. They're not. They don't have to actually spend their own money to, you know, have the artifice of celebrity. When the reality is, a lot of this press stuff. Remember, that was when Monique got, you know, had her uh, butting heads about Precious. She was like, wait. Y'all don't pay for me to go to the film festival? And they said, no, we nev- we've never done that. <laughs> and Monique was like, well, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> it. There are literally, there are people who are like, I'm in a big movie and I am like struggling to pay my bills while I'm doing press for this movie because I'm not being paid for this. But it's somehow and the public in the, has no clue. Yeah, but it's somehow like in the contract to go or be involved it's in just, some way. Yeah, it's just, yeah, it's... It's just like generally accepted. I, I think there are some times where you might get paid for press, mm. but traditionally those are things that it's expected out of your own pocket that you will fly yourself to certain places. You will pay for your hair and makeup. You will do certain things like that. Um, and so, you know, these are things These are things that I'm so thankful for our unions because I'm in WGA and SAG. I'm so thankful that they that they communicate with us in a way to say what's going on with you guys. Yeah, how are you feeling about where you're at in the industry? They're always taking stock in that way, so that when our negotiations come up, they can advocate for us. Um, another thing in SAG that we're we're pushing for is uh, hair and makeup equity. Just the idea that like when you book a role that I get to have a meaningful contribution to who is doing my hair and makeup. Because I'm sure you know, Mm. you come to set and they're like, oh, you look great. Your skin's amazing. You don't need anything. Mm. Mm. No, I do need something. You just don't have my shade. Yeah. Coming at you 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 looking like a Tyler Perry wig. (laughs) Listen, (laughs) who did the body? Like you look casket ready greasy on television they don't know how to do your hair you know a lot of a lot of actresses are buying their own wigs before they get to set 
because they are so worried about coming to set and them not knowing how to take care of your hair. It's a real thing. And, and it, it's wild that it's gotten to this point where we're like, hey, we, we need this. This needs to be in writing that we will be you know, properly taken care of. But the reality is for a long time, it's just been kind of accepted as, yeah, you go get your hair done before you come to set. Cause you don't know. It's fascinating. Cause I, th- I, th- cause it's like when you, <laughs> I made the mistake of going to film school, but like when you learn about the history of film and like everything, like you realize how genuinely scrappy filmmaking actually is. Like it's such yeah. a, it's actually such an incredibly scrappy industry. <laughs> Um, and a lot of people don't realize that because, yeah, they just see the award shows and they see the finished product, which is like an amalgamation of this beautiful thing of when art meets business and like, you know, all everybody coming together, yeah. cast, crew, whatever. And of course, the studios show the best parts of the crew of like, everyone's getting along. Yeah. Look, these cast members became friends for life, you know. But also, you know, to that same point, you're thinking about the big TV shows, the big movie stars. People aren't thinking about the commercials that you see on TV. Yeah. Someone's writing that commercial. The person who is walking around in the background while, you know, the explosion is happening with Leonardo DiCaprio, all those people are actors. And those people are sometimes working on multiple shows as background, as featured, waiting to get their chance to have a line so that they can move up and get more opportunities to be on screen. When you're listening to a podcast and you hear a commercial, Mm -hmm. a voiceover actor is performing in that commercial, right? When you're watching Good Morning America, someone is writing the prompter copy that the hosts are reading. But because it's done in a way that is so seamless People don't think that there's somebody actually like pulling the levers, you know, like Wizard of Oz, pull back the curtain. There are people back there working. I think it's a testament to how good we are at our jobs. But at the same time, those people deserve to be paid fairly. Yeah. And it's also crazy because like there is this mentality that I find with artists in general of like, oh, well, you do it for the love of it. And it's like, bro. (laughs) Right. Does my love landlord does do bills. it? Yeah, does my landlord do it for huh. the love of it? You know what? This month, I'm just gonna give you some love. Like, no, <laughs> no, you have to pay. And you know what? I always I push back on that too, especially in the conversations that we're having right now around the strike, because this the people who work at the studio, those are salaried employees. They are paid year round. They get Whether bonuses shows do good when the shows not. do really well. Yeah. <laughs> They get bonuses left and right. And we're just being paid as like contract workers, right? Right. Like you do a job, you're contracted for this many weeks. You don't know if the show is going to come out. You don't know if the show is going to be successful. You don't know if the show becomes successful and you're going to get asked back, Mm -hmm. right? Like there are so many factors. It happens to actors too. You do the pilot, they test it and they go, you know what? We're going to cast somebody else. And you're sitting there going, I've been waiting around for you for eight months because you don't want me being in somebody else's pilot. Right. And now I'm not in the show. Okay. (laughs) You know, so yes, do it for the love. And that's part of it. The conversation we were having about the internet, like you, you absolutely have to love it and you have to have like a level of delusion because there's so many no's in this industry that you have to say, like, I really want to do this. I really have something to say. I really believe in this in order to keep going. But when your work goes on to pay for the Hamptons house of, you know, Bob Iger, like, no, I, I need to also make money in order to pay my bills and take care of my family and, you know, Live a comfortable and fulfilling life that everyone, no matter what industry you're in, I believe is entitled to. Hey y'all, I hope you're enjoying the conversation with Francesca. A few quick announcements. First, if you're watching the podcast here on YouTube, consider subscribing, commenting, liking this video. It helps with the algorithms that be. Likewise, if you're listening to this podcast though, wherever you get your podcast, consider rating us over there. Five stars is preferred, but we stand constructive criticism just as much. We always want to get better. 
And then finally, if you want to take things a step further, consider joining the Patreon, patreon.com slash Halise. There you get early access to these episodes and exclusive content, merch. In fact, the patrons actually got to sit in live while I was recording this episode with Francesca Ramsey. So cool stuff over there. Check it out if you're interested. And with that, let's get back into the conversation with Francesca. For the second half of the podcast, we're going to talk more about the differences between being an individual creative and artist versus working with a team. You know, a lot of people don't realize that to have TV and film happen, it is a very collaborative effort and years can go by before a project you work on ever sees the light of day, if it ever does at all. And so we're gonna get into the nitty gritty of some of that. And of course, we're gonna ask her for some advice for any of y'all who may be watching slash listening and wanting to have a similar career trajectory as Francesca, whether it be writing, acting, or anything in between. So I wanna shift for a second and do some like happy things. Um, Yeah. So can you tell me about what you did to get your SAG card and then what got you Mm. your WGA card? Uh, It was the same job. (gasps) My first writing job was in 2016 on the nightly show and I got hired as an actor and a writer. And um, it was so funny because I didn't, I didn't know I had to join. I just was like, whatever. And um, I think my manager, I was working on a short and my manager was like, we need your SAG number. And I was like, what are you talking about? And she was like, you didn't join SAG? And I was like, I don't know. I just got the job. I started coming to work. Nobody told me what to do. <laughs> she was like, you need to go to the SAG office right now. And pay for your thing. She was like, and WG. I was like, oh my God. I just got like, you know, I had never, I had like the most money I'd ever had. And then I was like, okay, now I have to turn this money over uh, to get my SAG and my WGA. Um, but yeah, I got, you know, I got a twofer out of one job. That's awesome. And with the W, like, so what is something, because you've been in this now for quite some time, like on the SAG, WGA, yeah. like writing and acting side. Yeah. Um, would you say, strike aside, obviously, (laughs) would you say that you are, how would you say, living the dream? You (laughs) You know, I say living the dream sarcastically all the time, but you know, I went to a performing arts middle and high school that you had to audition for. Dang. Okay. And, um, the school had acting, music, art, and communications, which was like um, creative writing and speech and debate. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I auditioned for the the school, my mom was like, well, you're going to do communications. And I was like, what are you talking about? No, I'm going to do acting. And it was not a fight, but we went back and forth on it. I was like, no, 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 I want to do acting. Mm -hmm. And so I got into the school for acting and I knew that that's what I wanted to do. I had no interest in writing. Honestly, my mother was like writing and I was like, no. And so, um, and then I went to high, you know, performing arts high school I went to um, acting school. I went to University of Michigan. Like, that's what I wanted to do. I knew that's what I wanted to do. So to now be in a position where, despite the strike, I make a living being creative and writing jokes and coming up with stories. And my creative process includes taking a walk around the block, watching different things, like, reading different things, talking to people and like pulling ideas. I never in a million years could have imagined that that's what I would be doing. I thought I was just going to be like an actor on a TV show and that was it. And what I get to do now is so much more um, enriching. I've made shows, I've made web series, podcasts, things that did not exist when I was in college. There was no YouTube when I was in high school it came out when I was in college and it was not a career. Right. It was just like a funny thing that you posted videos on. Right. So in many ways, I am living the dream. <laughs> it's just not the dream that I thought it would be. Um, but I, I always, I, I'm always so appreciative when I get to share that because I hope that it speaks to other people to say like the thing that you think you're supposed to be doing like might not exist yet. Um, the person you're supposed to work with might not be in the role that they need to be in yet. Maybe something's going on in their life that's going to inspire them to write the script that you're supposed to be in or going to make them 
found the company that you are perfect to be the director for, right? Like, um, and so as frustrating and, and uh, disorienting as this time is, I try to hold on to that to say, like, I don't know what's going to happen when the strike is over. Maybe the person I'm supposed to work with right now is writing the script that they're going to sell when the strike is over. <laughs> right. Yeah, sure. But has it been yeah. interesting for you transitioning from writing for yourself as like a singular writer versus writing for a team? Like how has that transition been for you? Oh, I love working with other people. Okay. I, I actually hate writing by myself. Okay. I, I'm, I've gotten good at it, but, um, truly begrudgingly I got good at it because I would, and maybe, maybe you've had this, I don't know, but I would meet people and I would be like, oh my God, we should work together. And I could never get them to rise to the occasion. I was always like, okay, let's do this date. And they'd be like, yeah. Whatever. And yes. then I'd be waiting around for them. Mm -hmm. So I was just like, fuck it. I was going to do it myself. Right. And so I had that. So happen so often that I just became like a solo, you know, one woman show. But once I got in the writer's room at nightly show, it was really, it was intimidating and overwhelming, but it was really um, inspiring to just meet all these people who knew what they were good at. And then they all came together like this well-oiled machine to create a show four nights a week. And once you kind of find your groove there's this idea of room brain where like everybody is kind of almost like thinking as a unit and you start finding people at the same time saying the exact same words or saying the same pitch. And you start to like learn each other's sensibilities and you're like, oh, this is something that they'll think is really funny because you've said a bunch of stuff that no one thought was funny. And then when they do think something is you're like, okay, cool. This is, I'm going to start doing this now. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's really beautiful to watch a character or a story evolve, start as one thing, and then just through the process of the show or you're on set and you realize like, oh, those characters have really good chemistry. Like maybe that we need to give yeah. them a romance, you yeah. know, um, or somebody at the table read flubs a line, but it's funnier yeah. flubbed. And you're like, oh my God, change it, you know? Um, <laughs> or they, you know, we had a, a little actress on iCarly who's just adorable. And sometimes she would mispronounce certain words. And we were just like, oh my God, let's like, I liked it that way though, you know? And so that's that's really fun. Um, it's it's really really magical, and especially when you get to hone in on what you're good at and just be like, "That's what I do at this job." Mm -hmm. um, that's really really beautiful. What would be some advice if you have any? I, like I know for me personally, people will ask like, "Oh." Um, what's your advice for a content creator? I'm just like, girl, start. I don't know. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like, do you feel, do, do you have any advice for people who are maybe considering themselves aspiring writers or aspiring actors yeah. who I would say don't live in the major cities? So don't live in New York or LA. Yeah. 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 I mean, I will say that was one really awesome thing that came out of the pandemic is that so many writers rooms are remote now. Mm. Um, so you don't have to be in New York or LA in order to be a part of the industry. Um, there's also thriving communities in Atlanta and Chicago and in Canada, like there's great work being made all over the place. Um, but a piece of advice I often give to people is to take a class if you can. There are so many workshops um, because you'll get the chance to try out your creative ideas in front of other people. You'll also get to collaborate and meet other people. I cannot stress enough the importance of building community. While writing often feels like a solo process, a high tide raises all boats. So take that class become friends with people in your class, write a sketch together, make some videos together. If they're shooting a short, you better be there holding a the light and doing the mic, you know, like start working together because what ends up happening is when they get an opportunity, they're going to pull you along with them. And, and it's not a transactional thing. It's just the idea of like, especially in an industry where you have a lot of long hours, you have a lot of deadlines, you have a lot of no's, it's a really long process. You want to work with people that you trust yeah. and that you like. Yeah. If I have to be on set at 5 a.m., 
I want to be there with people that I'm going to be cracking up at crafty services with. And it's the person that I met when I was in a sketch group 10 years ago. And I know that she shows up on time and I know that she knows her lines and I know she's going to punch up some funny jokes. That's how you build the community that's going to be part of your creative process for years to come. And it's not an, uh, you know, me versus them. A lot of people go into entertainment and they're like, I'm going to make it no matter what. It's like, no, we can all make it. Right. We should all make it together. Hmm. Like, why do you want this? If your why is related to somebody else, it's going to be really easy for you to get distracted or get burnt out. I want I want this because I want to win an award. Well, you right. can't determine if you're going to win an award. Right, that's outside of your control. I want to... <laughs> That's out of your control. I want to do this to prove to the, you know, so-and-so like, okay, that is someone else's, uh, you're putting the the ball in their court, you know? And so coming up with a why that really speaks to the creative engine that's going to keep you going when you get the no, when it doesn't work out, when you don't book the job, when the project falls apart, when there's a fucking strike for 115 (laughs) days and you have to go, why do I want to do this? (laughs) You have to know what the answer is and and no one can give that to you. And there's no, there's no right or wrong answer, but it has to be something that's going to keep you going because you're going to need it. Trust me. (laughs) What is, um, so with the strike itself, how are you, aside from, you know, general feelings of disillusionment with your industry as a whole, (laughs) of course, um, are you feeling any inklings of just like, this may or may not wrap soon, we're getting so, or is it just we in the, we in the thick of it, we rolling, we rolling in the deep? (laughs) No, I mean, I, uh, negotiations have resumed between the studios and the WGA. I think we're at three weeks now um you know they waited 100 days they had no communication with us we were waiting like we're ready um so i'm trying to keep that in mind as no news is good news they're still talking they're still figuring it out and you know again the reality is i don't know when this is going to end but it will end it cannot go on forever so far this is the longest Uh, The last one, you know, in 2007 was 100 days. Yeah. And what happened that time around is one of the studios broke off and was like, we're sick of this. We're ready to make a deal. And my hope is that something similar could potentially happen where, um, you know, studios are running out of material. Studios are pushing back award shows Mm -hmm. and, and movie premieres. And they're like, okay, if this doesn't wrap up, we're not going to be able to have these big blockbusters. The whole fall season is going to be impacted. Hit shows. Abbott Elementary was in the middle of, or not even in the middle, the early weeks of starting season three. Yeah. And they had to shut down. They're ready. All of us are like, we would, I would love to work. Let's go. It's, this is about y'all. So I don't know, um, but I'm, I'm optimistic. And this is a, 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 challenging time but the reality is when something is worth it it's always going to be hard Mm -hmm. it's not it's never going to be easy you think the civil rights movement was a fun walk in the park no it was like give us some fucking rights you know so so again we're not it's they're not comparable in the sense that like we are fighting for very different things but it's hard because it's worth it and it's hard because People in power very rarely want to give up power. The minute that they concede, you know, they are often tying their happiness and self-worth to, uh, they can't even spend all the money. How do you even spend a $32 million salary? You don't even see that money. You're not even going to miss it. You won't even miss it. (laughs) You won't even know that it's gone, right? Um, so again, it's, it's, it's challenging, but I'm so thankful for the way that we've all shown up for each other. And 
And, you know, people like you, for example, reaching out and saying, I want to support, like, I want to uplift y'all. Like, this is an industry that you want to be a part of. And, and we're doing this for you. We're saying like, this industry is not right. And the people who are going to benefit are the new folks who are going to potentially walk through those doors, get to be in those writer's rooms, get to be on set. And we want to make sure that you're protected and taken care of. And so it's really heartening how many people are showing up and being like, yeah, we agree. Like, we're behind you. You're going to win. Yeah. And it's also been interesting to see, like, who's been able to easily agree with everything. Like, A24 being like, what do y'all want? Okay, bet. (laughs) Right. Right. And, like, that's really beautiful because, again, it says to the studios, it's possible. Right. It's Absolutely possible. Um, I'm not sure the exact percentage for SAG, but WGA is only asking for 2% of the studio's annual profits. We're not asking for that much at all. Wow. They did a they did a breakdown recently of what each studio would have to give us in order to hit the amounts that we're asking for. And that they're negligible. I mean, wow. some of them are like 0.08% of profits. It's nothing. Um, But I did see a report that was saying that insiders are reporting that some of the studio's hesitancy is that if they give it to us, they don't have to give it to, you know, other markets. Foreign markets are like, wait, what about us? We're not getting, we're not getting residuals. And the studio's like, you shut up. (laughs) This is not about you. Mind your business. (laughs) Get back in that love is blind bubble and shut up. (laughs) <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh so, lord problem. how many things have you written like com- been commissioned to write that have never seen the light of day so people can understand oh, you know what i mean yeah okay yeah yeah well, sure um i've sold a pilot every year since 2017 and none of them have gone to series <laughs> and even now, like on the picket lines, it's something I, I end up talking to people about, people I've never met before. Just like, how are you doing? What's going on with you? How are you feeling? Whatever. Mm-hmm. And so many people are just like, yeah, you know, like I've been working on this thing for years and I, I hope it happens. And just, you know, not uh, tying your self-worth again, that why, right? Yeah. Like I, I'm doing this because I need this show to happen. It's like, no. I'm doing this because I want to give a voice to people that don't often have a voice in this industry. Mm -hmm. That's my why. I want to tell stories, untold stories. I want to give people a chance to see themselves, to be seen, to share who they are. And sometimes that means actually getting to have a show go on TV. Sometimes that means just writing a script. Sometimes that means just a funny video. Sometimes that just means a tweet. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the broadcast. Unless there's anything else, I always give people the final, like, leave it all on the field. Yeah. Is, is, it, is it okay if I plug a project oh, that I have coming out? Go for I'm very it. excited about it. Yes. It. Oh, my gosh. Well, I'm very excited after what has felt like an eternity. I have a new podcast premiering. September 13th, produced by ACAST with my best friend, Delon. The podcast is called Let Me Fix It. You can listen to the trailer right now across all of your podcast um, platforms. Uh, My best friend is also an actor and a writer and a producer. And every episode, we talk about things from the past. And then we talk about how we would fix it to make it better for today. So we talk about brands, books, uh, celebrity careers, one hit wonders, uh, toys that we had as kids growing up. And we say, is there a way we could fix these things? And it has been such a blessing amidst the strike because podcasts are not struck work. My deal closed right when the strike started, (laughs) which was incredible. We sold this podcast two years ago, two years ago. And uh, the universe was really like, you know what, you know what you need? A job. <laughs> um, and so I'm, it's just been so fun to work on. And I'm really, really excited about it. Oh, if you don't already follow Francesca, what are you doing? <laughs> no, but seriously, please go follow her. She's on Instagram and TikTok doing amazing things. And if you're feeling like you want to stroll down memory lane and see Francesca, you know, way back when if you will. Um, I will link to her YouTube channel in the show notes as well. So you can take a look at, you know, how it started to how it was going. You know what I'm saying? 
Also, don't forget to go check out her podcast. Link to it will be in the show notes. Get your life. Because y'all know I be not making episodes of this podcast very often. So in the meantime and in between time, <laughs> go check out Francesca Ramsey's podcast, okay? Um, check it out. It'll be in the show notes. And I mean, I know I'll be listening. So if you're watching on YouTube, in the comments below, let me know if this conversation has shifted your perspective on unions, striking, collaborative bargaining at all. And it's fine if the answer is no. It's perfectly fine. But, you know, I've covered the strike a couple of different times, specifically on the YouTube channel. And it's been really fascinating for me to see the different perspectives and conversations that have come out of covering the strike. Ideas around celebrity, ideas around self-worth, knowing your worth as well. And so I just want to continue that conversation in the comments below. Again, I'm Halise, endeavoring to persevere as always. And thank you so much for listening slash watching this bonus episode of the Trying to Be Somebody video podcast, season two, the Know Your Worth season. This time of year is actually when I start to try to figure out who I want to have lined up for the next season of the podcast. So yeah, if you have any people that you would like me to interview, let me know. You know, I need a, I'm debating on what the season theme will be, if anything, you know? So I am always open to feedback, thoughts, questions, concerns, meditations, affirmations. I'm open. I'll see you when I see you, y'all. The Trying to Be Somebody video podcast is a StumbleWell production. The intro music was written and performed by Belief in Music and produced by Jay Ruckers. The cover art for season two was designed by the talented Natasha Cunningham. <laughs>